There I was in the midst of it all. Look what they wrote about me. Admirable as the collection is in taxidermic skill and landscape arrangement, the most wonderful of all, the little Rocky Mountain woman herself who has killed many and prepared them all. The altitudes and surroundings are all so artistic and unique as to form an attraction even among the many fascinations of the centuries gathered productions. <laughs> yes, I was in the midst of all that. I didn't get to, to leave the exhibit very much. Thousands of people lined up every day to see my Rocky Mountain hillside and the over 250 animals and birds that I had brought with me. They were interested in the display, but they also wanted to know about me, this, this Rocky Mountain Colorado huntress, as they called me. Was she an Indian? Was she a half-breed? An Amazon? Did she live in a cave? Or worse yet, was she someone so thirsty for notoriety that she would take up deadly weapons and go on a rampage against the animal kingdom? <sighs> no. Hunting is what I do in order to, to do my work. I am a naturalist. I am a person who studies the natural world, looking through the woods, through, through the prairies, um, studying, studying the animals and plants, and, and learning their behaviors, learning their characteristics for science. I have my grandmother, Abigail, to thank for my love of the natural world. When I was growing up, on the frontier as it was then, first in Pennsylvania and then in Wisconsin, we lived so far from civilization as it were towns that my grandmother was the only companion that I had. As a little child now, I would take her hand and we'd walk through the woods and she taught me everything she knew about the natural world. In fact, the first time I ever took a needle and thread to an animal was because of Grandma Abigail. A chicken got into her squash seeds and she needed those for the garden. And so she grabbed that chicken by the neck and slashed open its crop, took out her seeds, and handed me that bird to sew back up. <laughs> Which I did, and the bird seemed none the worse from the wear. Um, and I uh, was introduced to uh, something I had no idea at that time I would use later. And my stepfather, Josiah Dart, he believed in education for women at a time when most thought it was foolish. I went to Oberlin College for a year and studied the natural sciences and art, and uh, I couldn't stay more than a year because the money ran out. I went back to Baraboo, Wisconsin, where our family lived, and taught school for a while. And then a wealthy widower in town, Mr. Maxwell, he contacted me. He had six children, the oldest two of which were ready to go to college. And he offered me the uh, uh, opportunity to go with them, as, act as chaperone, and I could take classes as well. Well, I fairly jumped at the chance to be able to return to school. And... But correspondence with Mr. Maxwell soon turned to the topic of matrimony. And uh, within a year, I married him. I don't know why. <laughs> I guess I was tired of the poverty and the uncertainty, and uh, for a woman to have ambitions beyond marriage and a family was considered uh, foolish. Maybe I was tired of, of, uh, of feeling insecure about my future, but in any event, I married her and went to housekeeping, an ill-kempt house, six children, the oldest of which was just a, a few years younger than myself. I, those were years of chaos and adjustment. I, I got involved in temperance activities. Women were starting to get involved in social reform, political reform, and all the way around, I thought it was a grand opportunity to begin to have a voice. Uh, oh, the only good thing to come from that marriage was the birth of our daughter Mabel in 1857. Mr. Maxwell's fortunes, however, reversed with the fading economy in the 1850s and by the end of that decade uh, we weren't sure what we would do to shore up our finances and then word came from the Rocky Mountain West that gold had been discovered. No, wasn't everyone going to go rich and get go west and get rich? 
And well, Mr. Maxwell thought that this was uh, the answer to our problems. And I wasn't about to be left behind. And so I left my daughter with my mother, and off we set across the prairie. No one intended to stay in the Rocky Mountains. They just came for the easy gold. Well, let me tell you how to keep your family in the gold camps. As soon as your wagon or your traveling party stops its forward progress, you, you light a fire and start cooking and sell food. And, and I did just that. I had a boarding house in one of the camps just in the mountains west of Denver. And I did well enough through my business that first year that we could buy a, a small ranch south of Denver. Now what we called a ranch in those days was some acreage and a little cabin of sorts. People often didn't stay right in their cabins all the time. Why well, a trip to town could take two days more. And if someone came along and saw that a place was unoccupied, they might think it abandoned and take up residence. We called those people squatters in those days. And sure enough, one time I came back to the cabin and someone had moved in. It was a, well, I couldn't exactly tell. I, I did look in the window though and, what am I doing? What are you doing in my cabin? And what are you doing in there? Stuffing birds? Could you teach me how to do that? Why, well, I shall be here first thing in the morning. Oh, I was so excited. I had never seen this uh, taxidermy, and this was going to be my introduction to it, as well as an opportunity to learn something about it. But when I arrived the next morning, he had changed his mind. He said my hands were smaller. I might be better at this type of work. And he wasn't about to lose his business to me. I wasn't interested in taking his business. I wanted to learn this, this art. The... Well, he would not change his mind. And possession is 10 tenths of the law in the West. So I waited until he left that cabin, as I knew he eventually would have to. And when he did, I went in and took all his belongings and carted them out on the prairie for him to go find. But not before I studied those birds. He, he, had, to, he had little forms of, of straw and excelsior. He had wrapped them with twine, and he was pinning and sewing those bird forms around this. I, I, well, I, I absorbed as much as I could at that moment. But then, well, I wasn't feeling very well. I missed my daughter. It had been a few years since I'd seen her. So I went back to Wisconsin to regain my health and, and see family. And as soon as I was feeling well again now, I went right to work. There at the Baraboo Collegiate Institute, there was a naturalist. And he wanted to begin natural history displays so that uh, people could come and learn about all that was being learned about nature. And there was a man adept at preparing field skins, a hunter in the area, and then myself, with just a little knowledge, the three of us put our heads together and started creating displays. And oh, wasn't the first project we did tailor-made for the work that I would eventually become known for. Someone gave us a bird pelt, and the, the feathers were all ruffled up, and, Nothing I could do could make those feathers lay smooth. And so I had the idea to put the bird up fighting in its nest. And uh, well, we did just that. Now we, we got a nest, put the bird in all worried and fraught, and off we got another interloper bird. And wasn't that grouping pronounced a success by us all? And that was the beginning 